now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. The Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show, live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, on 860 AM, WNOV, and W293CX106.5. So happy, and thank you for joining us on this Saturday morning to talk about gardening. Okay, so we're going to talk about preserving without canning. Canning is a great way to preserve. But many people don't want to do it. Maybe they don't want to put the work in. They don't. Maybe they don't want to invest the time or the money. They don't feel safe they don't about feel doing. They don't feel safe about doing it. So there's things you can do. People ask us, okay, how can I preserve this without canning? Or um, I have this, this, and this. What can I do to prolong it? Well, there's, we, we've got a, a couple of ways. Now, the simplest or the easiest for the time being would be just put it in your refrigerator. But that doesn't work for everything. No, but one thing you want to keep in mind is if you are harvesting root crops, so say that whether it be beets, carrots, um, pretty much any root crop, if you're going to store it in your fridge, which is fine for root crops, you want to leave the dirt on. And if you're not going to store it in your fridge, you want to leave the dirt on. That dirt kind of helps preserve it in itself. Airtight container is the best because it's going to keep it from drying out quicker than if you just threw it on the shelf. But like tomatoes, tomatoes you cannot just toss in your fridge. You don't want, you can, but you don't want to. Right, you don't want to. Because it messes up the composition of internally of the, of the tomato and it makes it taste horrible. And that's any, I mean, that store-bought or home-grown tomatoes, you do not want to toss them in your fridge. So uh, you can look at, you can go through and you can find on your search engine what's best to go in the fridge and what's not. Mm -hmm. But let's go, what, what can we put in the freezer? Sure. Because that so, list is a totally different list. Right, so you can freeze a lot of things. You can blanch them, which if you don't know what blanching means, some people call it parboiling. What you do is you take that item, you put it in boiling water, uh, depending on what it is, for a minute to three minutes so that it kind of cooks a little bit. Then you put it into an ice bath and then you freeze it that way. But there's things that you don't have to blanch. So for example, uh, things you have to blanch, like cauliflower, you can't just toss cauliflower broccoli into the freezer because it's going gonna, it's gonna to get mushy, but you can blanch it and put it in the freezer. Kale, green beans. Or kale, green beans. We do our green beans in the freezer. Kale, you would blanch it for a less amount of time, but it works well in the freezer. Spinach, any greens, really. Um, but for example, tomatoes. Say you end up with a whole bunch of tomatoes and you're like, I just can't can them right now. I actually had a friend on Facebook who's nine months pregnant who just asked me this. She's like, I have all these tomatoes on my I can't to. can right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and I said, you can you can put them in a freezer bag as as is, as they are whole. You know, cut out any bad spots, but um, put them in a freezer bag. And then once once you're, you're ready for them, you thaw them out. And actually, it makes them really easy to peel them that way, too. And a lot of and some people will do this because it's too hot during the summer to can, so they'll freeze all of their tomatoes and then deal with this in November, December, January. So the heat actually warms the house as well. Right. So that's a um, good thing. Now zucchini. The nice thing with zucchini is because sometimes we end up with too much of it. We always end up. It's not sometimes. It's we always end up with too much of it. Right. So if you have a zucchini, and you're like drowning in zucchini and you ran out of ideas and if you bake one more loaf of zucchini bread for your coworkers, they're probably going to throw something at you. What you can do is you can shred it and you can freeze it and then that way you can use it later on in whatever you want to use but it. But it has for. to be shredded. It has to be shredded. Now if you wanted to freeze it sliced or cubed or whatever you would have to blanch it. What's the best way of shredding zucchini in order to... Just like your food processor. Okay so you just want to kind of coarsely Pulse grind it. it. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's not just... Or you can just get out the good old shredder, shred it that way too. So it's got to be in that small particle yeah. format. Okay. And and that way you can just free it, pull it out and then it should be as good or... Right, you're not going to want to eat it fresh, but it's fine for baking, cooking, whatever, toss it in some smoothies, whatever you're going to do with it. Well, let's go with a bucket of sand. Now, this is something that the old timers used to do who... And back in the old times, they had root cellars too. I wanted you to explain this, old timer. Okay, bucket of sand. You would take, and this this works well for root crops, let's say turnips, rutabagas, uh, carrots, those type of items, you would bury it in a bucket of sand. You cut the tops off and then put it, layer them in sand and put them in the basement or a cool area in your house. What that is going to allow the plants to do is it mimics actually being underground. You also can do this with soil. For example, if you're going to do, if you're going to harvest Jerusalem artichokes, that's a crop that you don't see in stores very often because the longevity of life after harvest is minimal to a couple of days. So we'll harvest a whole bunch in the fall and we'll layer it in a five gallon bucket with soil, artichokes, soil, artichokes, and then we'll put it in the stairwell of our attic during the winter 
and then we can remove and harvest as we need. You can do the same thing with carrots. You can use sand or you can use soil. The sand, it's a little easier because you want to keep the soil, the, the sand damp, not wet, damp, so the items do not get moisture extracted out of them from the sand. Soil or compost, you don't have to keep it moist or muddy. It will work relatively balanced in the uh, layering of the soil, artichokes, turnips, rutabagas, whatever the case is. Uh, you can also, and I don't think many people have this available anymore or know what they are, is root cellars. This is the way 50, 80 years ago that you would just harvest everything and bring it underground and it was very, cool very cool. Mm -hmm. Not even, not, it's not so much like a basement because basements, are, even the rarest of basements that are not climate control are not nearly as cool as a root cellar. But you, that's, you can go online and look at some of the phenomenal pictures of root cellars and how they hold, held their produce for months on end. Uh, just keeping things in a cool, dark area of your house. Pumpkins, uh, spaghetti squash, banana, uh, uh, butternut squash, a lot of the winter squashes uh, we will keep and have kept for over a year. But you have to keep it in a cool area and oh. you have to keep it away from direct sunlight. If, you, if you're keeping it, you know, near your heater or your heat register, it's not going to be good. Now, keep in mind, if you're keeping butternut or spaghetti or pumpkins in the house, uh, in the corner, and it, it, the longer you let it set, the drier it becomes. It does, it is still edible but it does lose its moisture content throughout that year process. You really want to use it up in about six months at most. So we've had pumpkins that uh, has been a year and it's still good, but again, it's not as great as if you use it sooner. Right, so that is the um, whole like temperature controlled uh, preserving. So then there's fermentation which we spoke about um, a couple weeks ago. And we're going to have a uh, woman, uh, Jane Campbell, when is she going to be on? Uh, a couple weeks. A couple weeks. Yeah. Um, she does a lot of fermentation as well. well. Briefly, for those who maybe missed that, what is a fermentation process, uh, the definition of it? So basically you're using the good bacteria to uh, change the chemical component of the food so that you're introducing probiotics to it, but it's also a way to preserve food as well. And you do this in a jar or, or a crock or, right. or even a bucket. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do this in. And then we will t let's talk about dehydration. Dehydration is a way in which you can extract the moisture out of the fruit or vegetable or green and put it to a state of percentage of uh, moisture in it that is shelf stable. Yes. So we're going to do it with our tomatoes. Essentially, we're going to make sun dried tomatoes, but not with sun drying where you use the dehydrator. But that is a way to um, have. You can do a lot of things dehydrated. You can, people dehydrate their carrots they, for soups, um, onions, whatever. We've made our own onion powder, garlic powder. So those those are things that you can dehydrate and not necessarily food storage, but it is a food storage in a way because you're using the item that you've grown and herbs too. You can do that way. Now there's two types of dehydrators. Basically, there's two types. There's air forced heat through the unit, and there is just coils heat where it just naturally raises up through the produce or the fruit that you're trying to dry. I would highly recommend if you're going to invest in a dehydrator, get the fan driven dehydrator where it's pushing the air, the heat through the fruit because it dries a hundred times quicker than the coil natural air going up through and the fruit. And if you're looking for a dehydrator, you can usually find them at rubber sales. That is, that's where we found ours. and. It's very often easily found there. And you can spend $50, uh, and we're talking new here, 50 to 60 on a dehydrator or 500 to $800 on a dehydrator. It depends on what level of you're wanting to dehydrate. Big, small, industrial, commercial, home, it, it doesn't matter. There's a lot of different levels of uh, dehydrators in it. So there's just a number of ways in which you don't have to go get a canner and, and a bunch of canning jars to preserve your harvest, you can do this in a variety of different ways to get some longevity out of what you're harvesting now or buying at the farmer's market. If you're in the Milwaukee or surrounding areas, just tune your radio to 860 AM or FM 106.5. You can also find links on our Facebook pages, The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener and Home Canning. Our website, thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com, click on the radio tab at the top of the page, then click on the Listen Live button, and you'll have immediately access to our live program. 
Mobile devices work very well also. Go to your app store and download for free the TuneIn app or the Simple Radio app. Then search WNOV 860, save it to your favorites, and you can have access to our radio show live wherever you're at in the world. Our radio program will also have podcast replay under the radio tab day, uh, several days following the live broadcast. You can find all of these links in the show notes below. Our show airs 9 to 10 a.m. Central Standard Time every Saturday, March through the end of October. And we want to thank our sponsors because without them, this would not be anywhere possible. You can find all of their links under the radio tab on our website at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. For more information, please visit the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com.